Well, welcome back to another episode of the Addy Hour. It's been a while. It's been a few months, so I'm really excited to be able to host another great conversation. And today, I'm honored and thrilled to be able to welcome Joanne Coach P. McCauley to the Addy Hour podcast. Coach P., thank you so much for being here. Definitely appreciate it. Thank you. It's always great to be amongst a dookie. Yeah. That's, yeah. Always, that's always a good thing. Yeah, definitely a good connection there. And for me, I'll have to contain my excitement because as our listeners know, I'm a Duke fan, avid Duke fan, a Duke graduate. So this is a this is a full circle moment for me to be able to host you after watching you on the sidelines for so many years. Um, <laughs> and definitely appreciate just all the work that you're doing as well. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. Great to be here. Excellent. And by way of introduction, I just want to give you a little bit of, give our listeners a little bit of background about who you are and what you've been up to the last few years. But of course, that's something we'll delve into in the conversation as well. But Joanne Coach P. McCauley is a former NCAA Division I women's basketball coach, a position that she held for 28 years. And as she talks about, she's now taken on her greatest role yet. So she's forging a path to destigmatizing mental health and coaching those afflicted by mental health challenges to pass for a full and productive life. As I mentioned, Coach P is, has a history as an elite coach and a champion. Uh, she's led teams at Maine, Michigan State, and most importantly, Duke. Not really, but from my perspective, most importantly, Duke. Making National Coach of the Year and winning numerous championships at all three schools. She's the only coach in history to win Coach of the Year in four different conferences. And she achieved that five times. She's also the only Division I coach, head coach to lead two different programs to 30 win seasons and three national championship games appear, game appearances. So someone who has obviously excelled in her craft. But she's also a winner in life with a powerful story as someone who was diagnosed with bipolar disorder at the age of 30 while coaching at Maine. It was something she wanted to reveal for decades, but she was counseled Otherwise, because of concerns of the consequences that it might have for her career and on her teams. And even despite these struggles, she also had a bout with skin cancer, but still successfully raised a family and continued to triumph in basketball. But in 2021, she decided it was time to shift and to talk and become a mental health advocate and speaker, sharing her story to inspire and educate others on how to win without losing yourself. The result of her work has been a best-selling book, Secret Warrior, A Coach and Fighter, on and off the court, something we'll talk about a little bit more today. And she's also the author of Choice, Not Chance, Rules for Building a Fierce Competitor. So again, I'm just deeply honored to be able to host Coach P here. I'm grateful for the, all the work that you're doing in these spaces. And outside of even the mental health component, all the things that you do around mentorship is also something that's near, very near and dear to my heart personally and in my professional and academic roles. So I'm sure there's lots we could talk about on this podcast, but we'll try. We won't make the conversation go too long, but I'm just honored to be able to welcome you here today. Uh, it's thrilling. I love it. And I love the work that you do. I admire uh, work and brain health so much. Mm -hmm. Well, so thanks so much. Thing. Yeah. Thanks so much. And in a sense, I feel like the conversation that we're having is these are the types of things that have been really gratifying for me, even as a neuroscientist, be able to have these partnerships and these conversations mm -hmm. so that we don't just get stuck in our silos working and when we're working in isolation when it has so much importance and impact for our, our, our society in general. So I appreciate yeah. your willingness to come in to, for us to be able to engage that, to model it, and hopefully to move things forward in a very real way. Yeah, well, the podcast is fabulous. The diversity of your, your cast. I mean, everyone's got to be thrilled about that. Yeah. It's been a lot of fun and a lot of learning and growth for me as well. Great. Great. Well, as my listeners know, they're anticipating this. I always just like to check in with people and see how people are doing just in the midst of everything that we're experiencing. Obviously, we all have our personal joys and challenges that we walk through on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but at this point in time, October of 2022, we also have elections that are coming up in the U.S., all the tensions around that. There are obviously things that are continuing to go on all over the world uh, in Russia and Ukraine, the challenges that have come up in Iran recently with some of the women's rights issues that were still trying to see if things will change for Brittany Griner coming back to the country, obviously just to name a few. But I always just like to put things in context and just see how you're navigating on a day-to-day -day basis with, with all things personally in your life and just and we're on the world stage. I, I think, um, well, you mentioned Brittany and, um, you know, she's a fabulous person and mm. what she did at Baylor was incredible. I didn't know her personally. I don't mm. know her personally. Mm -hmm. um, but she was the reason why we didn't go a final four, go to a final four. Yeah. She had a, a three-point play in Memphis. 
uh, that knocked us out. Mm-hmm. And Coach K and the guys, John Shire and Nolan, they all went. Mm-hmm. And so we made it as far as the Elite Eight together, but we didn't quite get to that final four. Right. Um, I remember that well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, good times, though. A lot mm-hmm. of success. And getting mm-hmm. back to Brittany, I just I keep trying to think about prayers and thoughts that she's mm-hmm. a strong she she's strong. And I know mm-hmm. this is the biggest challenge of her life. Mm-hmm. And I, I can't imagine. And the world stage in all regards is very difficult. And I just try, I try to focus in my world to do what I can mm-hmm. for mental health advocacy and understanding mental health impairment and and trying to motivate and guide the best I can being a non-medical expert, uh, but just definitely learning a lot in 27 years. Mm-hmm. That's really well said. And I appreciate just walking us through your, your thoughts and, and, and concern um, in the midst of the work that you're doing for Brittany and, and that whole situation, but just also thinking about how you're making an impact. Um, and it's interesting for me to hear you speak as a coach. I mean, you're not coaching anymore in that sense, but to kind of hear how that has translated into what you're doing now and the ways that you're continuing to coach in a sense uh, with a different or maybe an overlapping mission. Um, so again, for me, that's really encouraging. Um, but before we delve into that a little bit, just wanted to have you also just take our listeners through your path and how you got into coaching in the first place. And I guess we'll get to touching in to the way that you're coaching in society right now too. But just curious to hear about your general path. Well, I was very blessed with great mentors and leadership Mm -hmm. on all accounts. I was down at Auburn as a graduate assistant, became an assistant coach. I learned from Joe Champy at Auburn, Mm -hmm. Pat Summit, Sue Gunther, Mm -hmm. uh, fabulous people. And I was a head coach at 26 because I'd had that exposure to the Final Fours, National Championship, became that head coach at 26. And I was I read all Coach K's books. I hadn't met him or anything, but Mm -hmm. there weren't as many books out at that time. Mm -hmm. So I'm a Navy brat and you know, he's an army person. Mm -hmm. So I was really pulled to that story. And so that's when I started studying uh, Mike and coach K and all of that. And I had eight years at Maine and seven at Michigan state. And that's where I bumped into Tom Izzo. Mm -hmm. And, and we actually did go to final four the same year. And that was quite an experience. I learned a great deal from him and being uh, working alongside a coach K for 13 years was quite an experience. And so I've been very gifted. I've been very fortunate and blessed to have incredible mentors along the way. That's outstanding and great to hear. Was I'm curious, 26 as a head coach, was that surprising at that time? Was it an anomaly? I just thinking back to landscape, I'm curious what your experience was like at that point. Um I was well at that time I was the youngest. Mm-hmm. I think the youngest ever was Pat. I think Pat mm-hmm. was like 22. Mm, wow. Um you know, I admire her greatly, and I, mm-hmm. I can't believe what what she went through with her brain. Mm-hmm. I just, you know, mm-hmm. you, can't, you can't imagine or even fathom that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think at the time, I was the youngest uh, Division One head coach, and and I was coming home to Maine. I'm from Maine, and so that was an enormous amount of pressure um, mm-hmm. to be wow. in your home state. Mm-hmm. And some of that pressure contributed to my, well, my episode and finding out that I was in fact, somebody with bipolar disorder. So Mm -hmm. I guess there's that awful experience. uh, But yet at the same time, I believe in the concept of the brilliant mind. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that if you seek balance, whatever balance you need to seek, Mm -hmm. that you will be your best ever. And so many people don't know that they can get through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really well said. Definitely something I want us to come back to in the conversation as well, because one of the things that has come up you know, on this podcast and just in conversations, it's that idea, as you talked about getting back to a place of balance, but the idea of separating mental health from mental wellness. Mm -hmm. And this idea that you don't have to be, you can have a mental illness and still have mental wellness. Mm, Absolutely. And at the same time, you cannot have a mental illness and not have mental wellness in terms of the day-to-day activities, how people are spending their time. So really helping us as a society to think about things that way and not to just put those of us who are struggling into a specific category of condemnation or, or struggling or mm-hmm. hopelessness, but to really kind of have that piece. And that's one of the things I've really appreciated with what you've been sharing with folks um, as well on this journey. Well, it's, you know, it's, a, as you know, and of course I'm preaching to the <laughs> choir here, but um, it's a continuum. And what I feel about the continuum is it's become much more blurred. And now mm-hmm. whatever was good for me, you know, back in the day, mm-hmm. and I realized, 
bipolar disorder might be 5%. I don't know. We don't know because many are undiagnosed. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. Let's say 5 4%. The reality is my ability to relate is 100% mm-hmm. given what we've been through. And so sharing tips and ideas, whether it's a simple tip about sleep hygiene mm-hmm. or something more complicated, CBT, you know, cognitive mm-hmm. behavioral therapy, whatever it is, mm-hmm. we're on more of a continuum for it. So I guess that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. It's more blended. And, and as you know, brain health does not discriminate. Mm-hmm. I mean, it hits all ages and yeah. all races and ethnicities and everything. And I think that's the thing, actually, that is a great example to many other things in our world. Mm-hmm. Is yeah. that we have to come together. Yeah. It's a human thing. Mm-hmm. It's a human element. And I think that's has some irony in it. Yeah. You know, given all the, you know, segmenting that's going on. and Yeah. I think that's very sad. Yeah. I think there's a, a huge opportunity there and a lot of power as well. If we keep that human lens on things and use it as a way to bring us together towards mm-hmm. a common goal, as much as it can be used to go the opposite direction as well as a way yeah. to continue to divide people. So I think that's really, really important point that yeah. you brought it as well. Just to loop back a little bit, as much as you're willing to share, um, if you'd be willing to give our listeners some insight, you talked about the mentorship, about the pressure going back to your home state and the first episode. Um, if as much as you want to share how that all came about, because I think it's also very informative for people to be able to hear a bit of a journey and to have some understanding, because I think bipolar is one of those things that unless someone has walked with someone through it, sometimes it's hard for people to, to grasp or get a concrete sense of what that really entails. Yeah, it's pretty hard to diagnose, isn't it? It's, mm-hmm. it's a tough one. Um, what I can say is I was 30. It was a year after giving birth to my first child. Mm-hmm. And we were getting that program, wanting to go to the highest level and all of mm-hmm. that. I had a lot of pride in being from Maine. Coming mm-hmm. back, The program was sort of bottomed out at the mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. So it was a wonderful opportunity. Mm-hmm. And I took it very seriously. And so seriously that I lost a dear friend, was coaching, and then stopped sleeping. Mm. And I didn't think that was a big deal. I thought I was getting older, didn't need as much sleep. And that actually, it gave me more time to think Mm. and work and do. And my husband was not aware of that I had sort of not had two or three nights sleep. I said I didn't sleep well. And, but he, you know, what does that mean? Right. You know, remember, this is 27 years ago. There isn't a thought in the world about brain health, sleep hygiene, any of those things. Um, Not in the way it is today. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, wow, you know, this is good. I can be really efficient and productive. Mm -hmm. And then I think the fourth or fifth night, you don't crash. You just, you know, as you know, the mania accelerates. Mm -hmm. And the interesting part about it was I was very good in front of my team Mm. because I was very positive. I was projecting championships and great things for the program. I was organized and on it. And if you came to practice, you would have said, wow, what an enthusiastic, Mm. organized coach. The positivity was through the roof. Mm -hmm. So they were taking that in. But it was, I was fortunate, I, it was sort of over a weekend, I believe, where my husband and a couple of their friends recognized that I was losing reality. Mm. And the biggest part that is in my trailer is I'm talking to a recruit on the phone. And I tell her that the, the TV is talking to us, you know, talking to me and to her. And this is on my trailer, which I present when I speak. And she was a great kid mm. and chose the University of Maine, which is an interesting caveat. Wow. Yeah. And she said, What, you know, what do you mean, Coach B? I said, No, I'm telling you, it's telling us, you know, great things. And before I could get into a long conversation, John grabbed the phone mm. and he said, Jamie, Coach P is just having a moment here. Wow. And we'll we'll call you back. And so that's how that started. And then my husband had to trick me, so to speak. Mm. That we were going for a drive to take me to a hospital. And then I deducted, oh, there's something wrong with him. Mm. You know, so in my weird paranoia, 
I started to think about, wow, what's wrong with him? So I happily went to this psychiatric hospital. Mm -hmm. I said, boy, we have to take care of him. And the reality didn't hit me until they shut the door. Mm. Uh, It's done differently now. Mm -hmm. But the way, what I had to go through was a little bit different. And it was kind of like a one flew over the cuckoo's nest kind of thing. Mm. And I was, the door shut. And then I realized I couldn't get out. And so that's, you know, there's this whole scene in the book that I cover about being locked in and I run around trying to get out and they had to, you know, tackle me and, you know, the shots and the whole thing. And, Mm -hmm. um, so I try to, you know, things have come a long way Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we should be very proud of that. Yeah. Of where it's come. And, and so that was my first episode. And just very quickly, my second episode was only because I stopped taking my meds Mm -hmm. because I thought I was better. Mm -hmm. I'm an athlete, didn't want to take any medicine. And my doctor said, if you do that, you know, you probably will struggle at the time you don't want to struggle the most. Mm -hmm. And I didn't believe that. But sure enough, in February, in the middle of the season, Mm -hmm. I had a depressive episode. And most people think a depressive episode is, um, you know, feeling way down. But it's also you can't read the newspaper. As you know, you can't function. I couldn't. Mm -hmm. I couldn't write up a play. Mm -hmm. You know, my it just was not happening for me. And then I couldn't coach in a game. My jaw locked up. I had allergic reaction. Mm -hmm. And long story is, I had to bring this team in and tell them that I had let them down Mm -hmm. and that I hadn't taken care of myself. And after that, when I did that, and the good news is, we won a championship that year. This one. Mm -hmm. We did lose mm-hmm. that. We did lose that game right. by thirty points, and because the women knew something was wrong with me, mm-hmm. yeah. And, um, yeah. So that was my story then, and I've had a third episode, and, and ironically, that was after leaving Duke, mm. after getting out of coaching wow. completely. Wow. I think that's significant because people think, oh, it's all this pressure that forces these things. Mm. And if that's the case, I do have one example of that. Mm-hmm. My first episode, but my third, I was on vacation. Mm. Different story. Yeah. And so I think it's important to recognize the complicated nature of it yeah. all. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that was really well said. And I, I mean, again, just appreciate your love, level of candor and so many, I mean, so many important lessons that you even just talk through and talking through your experience. I mean, thinking about the way that your husband, that family stepped in and was looking out for you and paying attention. I mean, that's such a key point for those who are willing and able to actually notice differences and then to be proactive and help you navigate through that. But then also just even on your part, just the, um, the humbling experience that it must've been, even as the realization was coming along different ways, as you talked about your first experience at the hospital or things that have happened since then, the aspects mm-hmm. of resilience that you had to show, but then also just navigating, knowing how to navigate, having one experience, not taking a medication, how that impacted you. So, I mean, so many important mm-hmm. lessons that you just shared, even in just walking us through that. So, so kindly, which I think is important. And then even that, I mean, that last example about the vacation, again, just the complexity of these challenges and that it's not always predictable, not what people may think. So I appreciate you yeah. taking through that. And for those who haven't heard or, or, you know, have that concrete aspect. I think it's just really helpful to even hear what that looks like. Cause in so many situations, like you mentioned with the coaching, the manic side is just hard for people to grasp because it looks so productive in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, it does. And it feels that way. And, you know, what's really marked by my experience is mm-hmm. a death. Mm-hmm. If you go back to my first experience, mm-hmm. um, it was the pressure of being a coach. Mm-hmm. And it was the death of a dear friend and supporter. Mm. And all of that kind of mm-hmm. you know, kind of went in a direction. Mm-hmm. And and I and, and the timelines aren't always clear you know, as you reflect backwards. Mm-hmm. And then interestingly, upon leaving Duke in July of 2020, mm-hmm. my episode does not occur until June of 21. Mm. And but yet I have a cancer scare, mm-hmm. I have a hysterectomy. And then October 18th, which is today, this is two years, mm, my, father, wow. my father passed. Mm. So I had my father passing and I sort of made it through. I made it right. around all these responsibilities and different things going right. on. And then I was going up to Michigan and 
on vacation. And it was the human connection piece that was costing me. Mm. I had lost a lot of supporters mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that loved me because I was with Duke. Well, I wasn't with Duke anymore. Yeah. And so, and that's not being a negative towards people. That's human nature. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't associated with Duke. And mm-hmm. so my commonality kind of wasn't there as much. Mm-hmm. Your circle gets a little smaller. Yeah. Yeah. And I had a dear friend really step away, you know, that I thought was a mentor for me. Mm. And so human connection broke. Yeah. And when that broke, that, you know, was interesting. And then again, I was in a psychiatric hospital, Munson in Northern Michigan Mm -hmm. um, uh, by Traverse City. But what I will say to go full circle on the story is the care that I received there versus the 26 year Mm -hmm. old was extraordinary. Wow. It was. (laughs) I mean, I could actually be cognizant of that Mm, in my journey. Yeah. Yeah. So important. I mean, just another thread of community that's coming through as well, too. Just the positive aspects of community, but also what happens when community is lost. Because in a sense, it almost sounds like maybe this is too far, but you're going through, I'm not being clinical here, but almost a mourning process of losing some connections and re-navigating. And that's something we talk about a lot. I haven't, not something I've looked to in terms of bipolar, but just the importance of community in general with mental health, how it can be protective, how it can help people navigate. So all those shifts in community, losing your father, which I'm sorry to hear about as well, but all those aspects too, which are foundational and which can also add a level of stress. Um, So again, I know you said you're speaking as a non-clinician, but I think it's so helpful the ways that you're pulling on all these different pieces and how Mm -hmm. they've impacted you. Because I think that's just helpful for listeners to hear as they or their loved ones maybe going through things and thinking about how those things and shifts and moves can actually have impact sometimes in ways that I think people don't want to necessarily acknowledge right away Mm -hmm. for fear of maybe appearing weak or not strong enough, but they all have impacts. And again, you know, me speaking as a neuroscientist, knowing that those things have impacts on our brains and Mm -hmm. how we navigate. So I I mean, I'm just appreciating the way that you're articulating that and talking through it and and giving life to it in a way that I think will be life-giving to people who are listening as well. Well, I hope so. And I I think that I've always, you know, live deeply, you know, Mm -hmm. live deeply, feel Mm -hmm. deeply. Uh, There's a wonderful, I guess that's a wonderful thing, Mm -hmm. but you add that to rumination Mm -hmm. and you add that to loss and grieving Mm -hmm. and, and not to mention my hormonal changes. Mm -hmm. I was no longer going to have children, but you know, that's emptying out. I mean, that is where everything goes. Yeah. And that's a very strange dynamic. And the other thing that, again, not being a doctor, but it's interesting that a hormonal shift, a mm-hmm. big one, mm-hmm. led to a third episode. Yeah. And a hormonal shift, a birth, mm-hmm. led to an episode at ex- almost exactly the same months. Mm. Wow. Apart. Yeah. And 26 years, you know, so I think I'm a, I think it's an interesting story. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I and the blessing in it, you know, the third episode, I was actually in the hospital for 12 days. Mm. It was bad. Mm. Um, my first episode, I was just in a couple nights and I was okay. with the team in two weeks. Wow. So we didn't we didn't lose a beat. I didn't miss a game. Mm. We just kept on moving. Mm. Um, but this one was a little bit more complicated. And you couldn't have you could have never told me that it could ever happen. And as a matter of fact, I said. So my family said, I don't even know if I'm really bi- have bipolar disorder mm. because I haven't had an episode in 24 years. I mean, not at Michigan State, mm-hmm. not at Duke. Just how could I thought, wow. And I guess the blessing was maybe this mm. is what I was supposed to do. Learn about mm-hmm. my brain just a little bit more. Yeah. And then go, go into this life. Yeah. I mean, that, that is an interesting way to think about it too. I know you talked about being a person of faith, not to say that the episode happening was, was ordained per se, but even in a way that it seems like as you are launching into this mode, it's also facilitating what you're talking about and even bringing a, a deeper level of understanding. And again, so many, you know, scientific ideas are coming to mind, even as you talked about other hormonal changes, things like that, because something that people are looking at actively just in the way that the hormones interact and act in our brains and the interaction, how it impacts cognition and mental health. So there's so many different layers there 
And again, I'm just, I'm impressed at your, uh, your insight and your introspection to be able to, <laughs> to know those, those things as well. So it's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Not to fast forward too fast, but to jump ahead a little bit and just also to talk about how that aspect of your journey is impacting what you're doing now. But I guess before we get there, I'm curious, how did it impact you as a coach mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. you came to this realization of having bipolar, navigating it, having the treatment, stopping the medication, going back, going back on, how did that impact you on a daily basis and even your perspective of mm -hmm. yourself and of your teams? Yeah, so that's kind of a long answer in a way, too. When I was 26, 27, 28, 29, I was the toughest, most unreasonable coach you could, you know, mm -hmm. this is back in the day. Okay, this mm -hmm. is where, you know, discipline was everything. Mm -hmm. When I was diagnosed at 30, I became a better person, a balanced mm -hmm. person, and the best coach I had ever been. Wow. And we, we won, now we won before I was diagnosed mm -hmm. and we won after I was diagnosed championships beat Stanford in the NCAA tournament, all these things. Mm. But the difference was my relatability, mm. which I became more intuitive. Mm. I became more clear about my surroundings and what's around me as I worked to make sure I took care of myself and mm -hmm. my child at the time, because my second child was born later. Mm. And um, I think that when I went to Michigan state, I was truly in my best self. Mm, wow. we, I didn't even have a psych in the state. Wow. I worked out of uh, my psych in Maine. I would see her once a year. Mm, wow. And, and we would connect and I would do my lithium levels and things mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I didn't have a therapist or anything. We were just moving along and play for a national championship in five years. And I use that cycle wow. because that's a pretty quick way to get to a national title game. Yeah. And I was recruited by Duke. Mm -hmm. I went to Northwestern, but loved Duke. And so when I was recruited by Duke to coach, it was sort of like, wow, you know, what an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And Gail had done such a tough job, mm -hmm. I mean, an incredible job. And what I mean by tough, it was a tough to follow such a legend. Yeah. yeah. And, but the way I saw it was perhaps I could be some kind of difference maker. Mm. Many people told me not to take the job. Wow. There was, because there was no movement upwards, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was national championship or forget it. Mm -hmm. you know? And <laughs> I thought that was kind of cool. You know, it's like, yeah. Oh, yeah, this is going to be great. And when I got to Duke, I just loved the team. There was wonderful talent. We developed wonderful talent. We, mm -hmm. we inherited wonderful talent. Mm -hmm. We went to the four straight elite eights. It was very hard to break through. We lost to Maya Moore in Connecticut. We yeah. lost to Brittany Greiner. So breaking through the final four proved to be very difficult. Mm -hmm. And we recruited some great players, Chelsea Gray and mm -hmm. Haley Gorecki and all those. And, um, but we, you know, played at the highest level yeah. and it was so exciting. It was met with so many challenges. I, I just can't even tell you. I mean, for so many reasons that make sense. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a rebuild, you know, yeah. and I was still at my best self. And I think the thing that people may not understand is as a demanding coach, you have your moments, often in the locker room mm -hmm. at, half, at halftime, mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe after a game. Yes, that too. In practice, closed doors. But I was my best self. Mm -hmm. And you have great relationships with players. And you have some that are not so hot mm -hmm. where you don't connect. And that's always sad because you remember those yeah. sometimes more than the ones that you do connect. Yeah. But yet I also had to tackle a player with a panic attack. But see, I recognized that. Mm. I had wow. education about yeah. it. Yeah. And I wanted I wanted support from our team. I wanted mm -hmm. I wanted quick access to psychiatry if mm -hmm. needed. Mm -hmm. And so I pushed the envelope a little bit there. Mm. You know, and we did we did different things, you know, hiring a strength coach and all these things. Um, but I will say that. I was very fortunate to have some great years coaching and maintain balance by basically being kind of a boring person, mm. you know, to routine, mm -hmm. you know, family, yeah, having a dog, you know, all these things in place. And, and that's why I worry about young people that don't have all these mechanisms. Mm. You know, you can really fight through for your children. 
you know, of course, for your partner or spouse, but it's not the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's your children and you've got to, you know, step up and really stay with your routine, Mm -hmm. your swimming or whatever it is. And, but I think of young people today, what if they don't have, they don't have those connectors and they're not old enough to understand. I mean, I was 30 when diagnosed and Mm -hmm. it just, it drives me a lot to think about the loneliness that, Mm. that they feel because I have definitely been there. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So well said. I mean, I'm still just processing all the different pieces that you've, you've pulled out uh, and getting to this last point of just the, the impact and thinking about young people and those that you're, you're, you've navigated with and coached and mentored the way that you were intuitive to it. But even something you said early on about how this made you a better coach and a better person, because some may have assumed that the way you characterized being disciplinary before was the most effective, but it sounds like there was another layer on top of that, that you're really able to tap into that kind of carried you through with all these different aspects. And just, again, I guess I'm, I'm going back to the community again. It seemed like it, it it enhanced that aspect of community and the ways that you engaged in community just in terms of perspective. Yes. And you can trust again mm. after all the sadness, trust is a mm. big issue, but not just trusting yourself, but trusting your players. Mm-hmm. It's no secret that we end up beating Stanford after I'm on meds, right? We, we do mm-hmm. something incredible uh, because we're, there's trust and there's a balance of energy. Mm. Well, of course I yelled at that team. Mm-hmm. Of course I got upset <laughs> with that team. Mm-hmm. You know, but but there's an overall respect and care. And again, you know, through that journey at Michigan State and Duke, there's definitely been that respect and care. But the trust factor changes when you become diagnosed, when you can trust your doctors. Mm-hmm. You know, listen to your doctors. Don't go it alone. Mm. Now, I will say that the minute you think you can do it alone, that's exactly the time mm. not to. Mm. And I just can't stress yeah. that enough. Yeah, that's really, really important advice. And I think that's something that people need to hear and need to hear over and over again, because in the moment, that tension will definitely come back Mm -hmm. in terms of trying to navigate alone and to hear someone who has walked through it and just to know the importance of staying connected and building that trust, I think is is critical. I'm also curious, I guess I'm going to expand on the trust idea a little bit and even make it bigger to to a societal sense. Because part of your story is also the aspect of being diagnosed early on, but not sharing it broadly and the counsel that you got versus Mm -hmm. what we're seeing now with a lot of people who are being more open Mm -hmm. about that earlier on to encourage others, but it's still challenging. It's still something for people to walk through. Where where do you think we are as a society in terms of that trust? Are we giving people Mm -hmm. the space to walk in that? Or is it just... um, just lip service and, and I don't know the best way to put it. Yeah, I understand. Glossing over in a sense. And that when it comes down to the real, how we really treat people, are we really, I guess, are we really walking the authentic trust or just a facade? I know that's a way, that's a way to, <laughs> not to put all that on you, but. Well, it's a selective space that we're allowed in. Upon going public after leaving Duke, I mm-hmm. actually had a, a blog somewhere say how dare I could not share that publicly. Mm. I was shamed for not sharing. Mm. And the thing about it is, is that when I was given the advice by a doctor, the advice was extremely important because it was said, and I believe this, that it would have all been about me. Mm. I would be in a press conference if I had gotten upset. Usually in games, I was pretty, you know, things I, on the sidelines, we're in the bunker together. Mm-hmm. You know, so practices were, I was tougher in practice mm-hmm. than before, right? Mm-hmm. You make practices tougher yep. than yep. you do the game. Yep. Um, but still, it would have taken away from them. You know, they would ask questions. I would have mm-hmm. been studied and mm-hmm. looked at. Yep. And of course, the negative recruiting would have been. Yeah. Incredible. So I think the answer is in selective spaces, people can, if they're ready, share. But many times people still cannot share. Mm -hmm. And People said, would you go back to coaching? I wouldn't change what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I do not take a salary. I'm raising money for a foundation. Mm -hmm. I have been working as hard as I've ever worked, but I do kind of pick my spots. Yeah. 
which is nice and set my own, you know, schedule. Yeah. I used to have a nice salary <laughs> once, <laughs> once, once upon a time. Mm -hmm. um, not when I started in coaching, but later in coaching. Right. And so I do set my schedule and it's wonderful and it's coaching lots and lots of people. But if I wanted to go back into coaching basketball, I don't think I could mm. because it would take a visionary. Mm -hmm. It would take an athletic director that wasn't always looking over his shoulder, which most of them do. Mm. And I love athletic directors. I, I've worked for many fabulous ones, mm -hmm. but I have to say it's getting a little bit plastic mm. in regard to Teflon. Everything bounces mm. off. Everything bounces off of people. Mm. You know, it, it's, it's, everyone's actually operating from fear. Mm. And so I don't think I would be hired mm. back if, even if I wanted that to be the case. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And that's really poignant as well. I mean, I then I think to your point, that fear is there. I'm assuming you're talking about even without thinking about the mental health aspect. And so you add yeah, I mean, I think later that, on and navigating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just think that as a woman, you know, I am not a bipolar coach, mm -hmm. I'm a coach with bipolar disorder. Exactly. Yeah. And that's a big distinction. Yeah. And frankly, I'm the best coach I've ever been right now at 57, coaching every human that is in front of me or giving me the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I say coaching because I'm not a doctor. I'm not a therapist. I know a lot about CBT because it was used with me. Right, right. And so, I mean, I, I paid attention and I've studied. I've studied this whole, these dynamics of depression, anxiety, and, and how it manifests and mm -hmm. what the value of my swim is five times a week and mm -hmm. you know, yeah. all those things. So I've, yeah. I, I have a... I have some referent power that I think can be mm. very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. And to follow up on that, what is, so what is a, maybe not a daily schedule, but what does the day to day look mm -hmm. like for you? How are you, how are you doing that coaching at this point and integrating? I mean, as we're talking, I'm thinking integrating your coaching knowledge, your basketball mm -hmm. knowledge, just your, your insights into mental health to, to this full kind of onset of tools that you can give people. Well, it's interesting. I used to have my schedule set for me. Mm. Yep. <laughs> and, and, and it's, you know, seven days a week. It's yeah. one of our objectives 24 seven. Mm -hmm. You know, you know the drill. Okay. So that was that. Now I have to make sure and be more diligent than ever in creating my own schedule. Mm. That free time and idle time leads to ruminating. Mm. And with a depressed person, mm -hmm. with an anxious person, with someone with bipolar disorder, mm -hmm. um, and a person having a bad day. Yeah. And so, Scheduling my morning time, my writing time, my devotional time, you know, that that can't be missed. And initially I was missing that because I used to get up at 530 in the morning to have that time. Mm. And then, of course, I stopped getting up at 530 in the morning. But then I would roll through the morning and then I didn't do any of my thinking or mm. my writing. Wow. And it took me a while to come back to that. So wait a minute, Joanne, you this is part of who you are. Yeah. And so. You schedule the days, you schedule things, and you spend time with the flowers. And, you know, you, you schedule time, though, to stay very busy. And mm -hmm. my my swim is five or six days a week. It's non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. I'm a member of the Y. I swim wherever I speak. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. Especially if I can do that day of talk. That's really mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, But my weightlifting, you know, is not for vanity, although I like that I'm in shape. That's mm -hmm. good. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a very good, oh gosh, not only for bones, but mm. for your mind, that's a mm. good one. Yeah. And I talk about water therapy a lot, mm. you know, bathing and um, sweat is water. Mm. Sweat is really important. Mm. And, um, and eating, you know, eating at roughly the same times, mm -hmm. you know, taking care of yourself. I don't even eat after 7.30 and people say, well, that's interesting. I said, well, I don't feel like it. Mm -hmm. My body doesn't like it, mm -hmm. you know, and, I, and it's a healthier way to live. Yeah. And so, you know, it's not a pious thing. Y you learn this works. Yeah. You know, walking the dog every day. That's a really good thing. Yeah. Not to mention the dog liking it. Yeah. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, so it's, yeah. not, it's not rocket science, but it is discipline. Mm -hmm. And it is awareness. To yourself. Yeah. 
And if you're not sleeping well, you need to be pay attention yeah. and, and make time for that um, because it's critically important. And obviously I've learned all this. Mm-hmm. And if I could give this wisdom to whomever and just, you know, cut short their learning curve just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Because I wouldn't want people to have to go through what I went through mm. if you can help them. Yeah. And I appreciate hearing. I mean, it's, it's so clear how your passion is spilling through and everything you do, even as you're sharing all these tips, even before you said to help others. I mean, I could just sense that, that, that you can you really want others to be able to get this so they can put these things in place and really have that full life, as you talked about, too. And the importance of all those routines that you've mentioned, the, do- the dog walking, that's its own interesting aspect itself. So we had a couple of guests who came on and talked about social bonding and oxytocin. Um, that's released in our brain. There's some really interesting studies actually about people and dog interactions and how that also facilitates oxytocin. And so even what you're talking about just taps into a lot of those aspects of how, how it's good for, for us and for our brains in general. And just all, I mean, all the things you mentioned, I'm going to put a shameless plug in here as well, because okay. my dad actually joined for one of the episodes because he's a sleep physician and just talked about so many specific wow. aspects of sleep hygiene that you talked about all the impacts that it has on mental health. Um, and ways we can adjust and, and, and notice things that are arise. So, I mean, everything that you've, you've mentioned just resonates in so many ways. And I'm so glad that you're sharing that um, with others as well. Wow, you come from quite a family. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> you guys are pretty smart. I don't know. That's pretty smart stuff getting through all that orgo. I mean, yeah. us. <laughs> <laughs> I had good role models. Yeah. Um, but as I've shared in some other instances, it, t- it took me a minute to, to incorporate that into my own story. So that that's a whole nother story itself in terms of the, uh, what should we call it? The uh, factor of putting myself into it versus the laziness. So that's, that was a journey as well. Um, but yeah, definitely have great examples um, from both of my parents, both from opportunities. They both grew up in Ghana, West Africa, but then also from their faith perspective and just the opportunities they created for us and letting us come to that space um, of learning to navigate. So a lot of ways it kind of ties in with the things that you've talked about you know, when you think about your children and how we pass those things along, but also create those opportunities. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know it's a tangent, but I, I had to go there because you brought oh, it up. Oh, it's a <laughs> That's a great story. Yeah. I bet it would be an amazing book. Well, I appreciate that. And I shouldn't, I, mean, I shouldn't give away too many secrets, but listeners don't know, but I'm actually thinking about the book project. So since you mentioned that, Good. I'll just throw Good. that out there and say there are things in the works. Good. But I'm going to pull now. I'm my neuroscience is coming back in because you know it's so helpful to hear you talk about all these practical tips. And I always think about how it impacts the brain. I try not to be too centric on the brain, but again, that's that's my expertise in the area of of work. But I know that you have also talked about the importance of how we have to be able to understand the power of our brains. And so I'm curious what you mean when you say that, and how you navigate that when you're sharing with audiences or individuals as well. Well, I think that. You know, a balanced brain is the smartest brain the brain can be, right? So you, so we're all going to work for balance and we all have different journeys to that balance. Mm -hmm. And for me, I've had to negotiate through my life. Again, being an athlete, I didn't want any foreign substance in Mm -hmm. my body. Mm -hmm. And I knew I could overcome anything. Mm -hmm. I've had to adjust. I've had to learn to listen. Mm -hmm. I've been on lithium since the first day I was diagnosed Mm -hmm. to now. Mm -hmm. I'm a big lithium advocate. I know that everyone cannot take it. Mm -hmm. I feel sad for that. Mm. I feel like lithium is the best drug. And Mm. as you know, founded years, I mean, Mm -hmm. many many moons ago, I had to learn about lamictal, another powerful uh, medicine. And I am a lithium lamictal person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they have played off each other. And I even gave birth to a a son while taking lithium. Mm -hmm. And that there's very little research yeah. done on that. And that was, that was a, a, obviously a, a different time and a long time ago, he was born in 2000. Mm. And so I feel like then I've understood what clonopin can do. Mm-hmm. I, you know, certain things I don't like, you know, certain drugs, restaurant is not my favorite. Mm. I could not do a commercial for restaurant. Mm-hmm. The addictive quality of it. And getting off of it and the mm-hmm. hurts. And mm-hmm. I'm talking for me. I'm yeah. not talking to a listener out there who says, wow, that works great yeah. for me. Yeah. It's all very independent. And that's 
but you have to be a scientist to some degree. Mm-hmm. You have to study. You have to wonder how these things can affect you. There have been times, you know, I had kidney complications because of lithium. Mm. There was a pullback on lithium, but then that was premature. My kidney regentrified in a way that didn't make a whole lot of sense to mm. medicine. Mm. So I've had some interesting complications. And I just mm. think that if we're going to know our brains, you have to study all facets of it mm-hmm. and recognize that alcohol is something I can do in very small moderation. Mm. But let's face it, I don't need to be drinking while I'm taking some of these medications. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that Zyprexa is a mind numbing experience that Mm -hmm. actually became necessary for me at one time. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe the power of that Mm -hmm. drug. Mm -hmm. I love gabapentin, (laughs) my all time favorite, just (laughs) non-addictive qualities, Mm -hmm. helps to sleep. So, you know, and then Clonopin is an all time favorite because, you know, it works kind of quickly and you can Mm -hmm. feel that you can feel your chest. You know, anxiety is something I've had leaving mm. coaching. Mm. I've had more anxiety leaving wow. coaching than I did coaching in front of 30,000. Wow. It's really, again, it's really yeah. how things There's work. more unknown there, I would say, than yeah. what, yeah. Than what so you were doing. Yeah, something can be good. Wow. And I just throw those out there because you might have listeners that mm-hmm. are in fact yeah. having to work with these medicines. Yeah. And But you have to be your advocate. You have mm. to be educated. Mm. And I, when I talk with people and they're saying, well, I really don't know how much I take. I'm like, okay, wait a minute. Yeah. Go get your bottles. Like, yeah. are you kidding? You need to know what you're taking, how much. Mm-hmm. And again, you can't read though on the internet, all these things. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's crazy yeah. how much, you know, all these yeah. things that they yeah. say. So you stick with your doctors mm. and you try to test them and learn from them. And so I guess what your question was about, you know, max, how we maximize our brain health and mm. how we become educated about it. And I do talk to folks that have bipolar disorder and mm. I do remind them that mm. Van Gogh and others of great prowess were known to have bipolar disorder. And I do tell them that that means you have a brilliant mind, except mm. you have to find your way through the maze yeah. to get there. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. so well said. <laughs> That's so well said. And I once had an athletic director tell me best best um, compliment I ever got wasn't oh you won all these games. I had an AD and I love him. He said you are super smart. <laughs> and, I, and I said yeah yeah. And you know and I can yeah. say that because I went I've been going through the maze. Yeah. And yeah. just when I thought I had the maze figured out, yeah. I was given a much more sophisticated maze. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> highly agree and it just makes me think about i mean there's scripture passages being about being tested not being tested beyond what we can mm. bear and just the, even just hearing that in your story and the way that you talked about all those pieces as you got to a certain level of understanding as you're sharing that with others and then another twist comes along the way but i well, mean just yeah. yeah well the faith thing i do want to interject because i feel mm-hmm. so comfortable when i'm around mm-hmm. people of faith because mm-hmm. it's really important to me mm-hmm. and um I started with John 14, 27. Mm. And, um, you know, this is all about fear. Mm-hmm. You know, do not let your heart be troubled, nor let mm-hmm. it be afraid. And I feel like my whole life, mm. or most of it, I've been afraid mm. and scared about so many things I had to go through. Wow. And then as I transitioned, Esther 414, mm. you know, such a time as this, mm. you know, New Testament, Old Testament, are coming together and I realized that these tattoos were I got them over 50. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually think that's a good idea. Wow. You're gonna get tattoo, <laughs> wait till you're 50 because then you'll know what you want to put on your body. That's true. You've had a lot of time to think about it. <laughs> right. And then I, you know, when I have my tough moments, I do this. Mm, wow. You know, it's a form of this. Yeah. Like this. Wow. And um for me that that has been extremely and Esther, uh, the book of Esther is extraordinary to me mm. because of she does everything she can. Mm-hmm. You know, she and I, I feel like a lot of women um, or men for that matter, but a lot mm-hmm. of women could relate to the sacrifice and the, and her savvy and her intelligence mm-hmm. for what yeah. she's accomplished. Yeah. Yeah. That's so and I appreciate your, your willingness and. and comfort in sharing that as well, because I think that's so important, been such an important part of your story. And it's a lot of what we've talked about 
on this podcast as well, just mm-hmm. to the, the power of faith and what God allows us to navigate and through these different situations and to make sure that that's an integrated conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, because in too, in too many instances, just in conversations that I've had with people where people are trying to separate those things. So, I mean, that's something that's just mm-hmm. coming through in your story. Even as you talked about the medications, as you talked about the fear that you had to navigate and that you were acknowledging, spending time doing your devotions in the morning and just all these different aspects. It, it's in a sense, I mean, it, it seems like it's an ongoing learning experience and that's been the power. I mean, even as you were sharing about all those aspects, and I hope the listeners caught that too, about the mindset shift that you had about not wanting to put any medications in your body to knowing that we do have these tools. Mm-hmm that can impact our brains and help us navigate. Yeah. But then we also have the tools that we can meditate on scripture that can also help us navigate. And again, my neuroscience, again, all those things impact our brains. And so I often feel like these are all the tools that God has given us to be able to move through and walk through these situations. So it's well, actually beautiful to hear you to hear you say that and to- well, Wait a minute, what's it. beautiful? Wait, what's beautiful is that you're in academia at an Ivy League institution, being able to express the merging Mm. of all of these things. And I went to Northwestern, so I know what these worlds are like. Mm-hmm. And m- many times, you know, faith is so pushed aside, mm-hmm. you know, and I just do not understand how everyone has their thing, right? Mm-hmm. Spirituality, mm-hmm. karma, whatever it is, okay, mm-hmm. whatever you have, use it. Mm-hmm. But wisdom has got to be part of it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I get my wisdom from the Bible. And Psalm or Proverbs, okay, that's where I get my wisdom. Mm-hmm. Where do you get your wisdom? You know, I always joke I'm a Buddhist Christian. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I've heard that before. <laughs> yeah, I, I really, I sometimes that's I do funny. because of, in, in reading about things, yep. and I often do not talk about my faith. Mm. And I've been told not to talk about my mm. faith if I, if I don't have the right mm-hmm. audience. You know, and one of my one of my things I'm looking forward to someday is to get on the stage of a church mm. and really let it go. Like, yeah. I, don't know, I don't know what I would say <laughs> at that point, but I, you know, you just feel like you'd be in a safe space. Mm-hmm. Um, so I seldom bring faith into it. Although mm. in Secret Warrior, the book, I do, mm. I have a chapter on faith. Mm-hmm. Because the way I come around to faith is almost comical. Mm. I mean, it's, it's, it's baptized over 50. Wow. Yeah. So it, it's kind of, it is kind of funny to me. Yeah. That's the way things happen sometimes. Yeah. Well, I look forward to reading through. And actually, I mean, I'm always encourage listeners to listen to or read through, you know, different products and books that our guests have as well. But I mean, to your point, I think that's, it's been a positive shift over time. So I know I keep looping back to my dad, but when he was on the episode as well, one of the things that he shared was just the fact that we were having the conversation that we were having on this podcast Mm -hmm. that is published broadcast by Yale in the public space and how he couldn't, he would not have seen those things 30 years ago when he was training in psychiatry and the way this shift has come. And then others who have come on the podcast as well and just talked about the importance of not dismissing people. And I mean, that's been one of our themes too, to just think about how we approach mental health in general and not be dismissive of any one approach. But that includes whether someone has a faith background or not, not dismissing an aspect that is so central to who somebody is. And so, I mean, for me, I did do some training with some clinical psychology interns in New York, and it was encouraging to see the way the field has shifted to Mm -hmm. say, okay, we need to actually understand people's life's experiences Mm -hmm. if we're trying to meet them where they are. We can't, you know, the old school idea was that you don't talk about faith in Mm -hmm. therapy or, or certain taboo topics, but then how do you ignore a whole aspect of who somebody is? Um, and like you said, the power that comes with that and the way that people navigate. So for me, it's been really encouraging to be able to step into these spaces and then to also see people be receptive to thinking about things in a more integrated manner in mm-hmm. our academic spaces, in our faith communities. Um, because for me, and my listeners have heard me say this before, to me, it's always distressing if there's dismission on either side. So mm-hmm. someone is coming from a purely scientific lens and dismisses the power of faith. Or if someone's coming from a faith perspective and dismisses all that we know about science, even as you were talking about all those effects, those medications have had, how they've been positive. We can't ignore that and pretend it's not there. Um, so again, you know, my listeners are like, oh, he's going off on that again, but it's, it's a passion. And 
I have a like-minded individual here with me, so. <laughs> yes, very much so. And I, you said it extremely well. And in our world where there's so much separation, mm -hmm. you know, can we look for commonality? Mm -hmm. And if commonality doesn't match up perfectly, somebody believes in karma, great. But just wisdom. Can we mm -hmm. all agree that wisdom is mm -hmm. a good thing? Mm -hmm. And where do you get it? And I know the way I found it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't brought up in any kind of faith background mm. none whatsoever. So I know the way I came about and we all need to find a way to come about with it. Mm -hmm. with something that gives us wisdom. Yeah. Because life is too complicated. Yeah. You can't do this alone. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and so I, I just, oh, I marvel at what you're saying. And that gives me great inspiration mm. for what the reputations are mm. you know, out there with the ivory tower mm. that doesn't relate on many levels. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I had a psychiatrist say to me once, which was really funny, when I was having a weaker moment, mm -hmm. he said, do you have any faith? Is there any faith <laughs> in your background? <laughs> and at the time I did, I was like, well, yeah. And he said, okay, let's review that. <laughs> What's it all about? So I, I, oh, I love that's great. talking about the, yeah. you know, the whole push-pull and how it can all work together. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that's a great segue to what I wanted to close with too, because you mentioned the hope that that gives you. And I just was going to have you just share, you know, what gives you hope on a day-to-day -day basis and in the place where you are right now in life? Oh gosh, so many things give me hope. Mm. I mean, this podcast, mm. <laughs> I mean, your work and, and all of your colleagues and, and the direction we're moving, mm. you know, we're, we haven't arrived mm. and of course we never arrive. And so it's a process and we're in this process, but it's picking up steam mm -hmm. and the understandings are becoming more clear. Mm -hmm. And I feel I have great faith in people and the strength of people. And I just feel that we're, we're churning to come together. You know, like it, it's, it's starting mm -hmm. to develop where we, we realize that all we have is each other mm -hmm. and the human experience. And I think I feel that mm -hmm. I know when I speak and I speak to different people Obviously, I'm thrilled if my story can help just a little bit. Yeah. And I'm particularly thrilled when it ha helps young people. Mm. You know, you know, those young people that are just really struggling. I look at my son and losing almost two years at Northwestern and the pain that that mm. has caused him. Mm -hmm. And this going back to school is wonderful, except they're seeing what they didn't get. Yeah. You know, it's sort of, and yes, we should not look backward. Absolutely. We should mm -hmm. be present minded, but young people can always be present minded. Yeah. You know, so there's a lot of complicating things in our world right now, but I have tremendous faith in humanity mm. and um, I just hope to do my part. Mm. Well, I, I think you definitely are. And I, I know, I mean, even in this hour that we've had, just the things that you've shared, I know are definitely you doing your part in that way as well. And I, I know that this is really going to be encouraging to listeners. I imagine people will go back and listen to parts again, a lot of the nuggets and the wisdom just that you shared from your experience, the lessons you learned along the way um, and how important that is in so, so many different ways. So I definitely think you're making that impact. I'm proud to be able to, to know you and have this conversation um, even beyond the Duke part. <laughs> but although that was that was the foundation that entered the, yeah. the Duke mental health conglomeration Where entered into this space. Duke, Duke, Duke. Yeah. Duke, Duke, yeah, got a lot of that going yep, on. Yep, <laughs> yep, which is why I got excited when I saw your background. <laughs> I got it. Yeah. yeah, but again, I mean, I'm just so grateful for for the work that you're doing and even the way that you just shared so so wisely and candidly um, in this last hour. I think it's something that people will really be able to uh, to hear, things that will resonate, insights that people will have. And so, I mean, for me, it's just, it's an honor to be a facilitator in a sense, to just be here and let people come and, and share all these pieces of knowledge and experience with our listeners. So deeply indebted to you for, for taking the time for your investment and for what you're continuing to do. Thank you, Doc. I love Docs. I love all <laughs> Docs. You guys do great work and I so appreciate you having me. 